Good morning. Welcome to our online service here at Seagate Evangelical Church this morning. During the week, we've been looking at Peter Maiden's book, Radical Gratitude, and Peter punctuates his message by a psalm, encouraging us to read a psalm at the end of every chapter. And the psalm I was reading this morning eh, was Psalm 107, and it opens with these words. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. This psalm is a call to praise. And four times over, the psalmist writes these words. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works towards the children of men. Now, th these words must be important because they're mentioned four times. And it could be summarised in this way. The first mention of the, these words is in verse 8. And we should praise the Lord because he satisfies the deepest longing or emptiness in our hearts. He rescues the penitent from the consequences of their rebellion. And again, these words are repeated in verse 15. We should praise the Lord because he breaks down impenetrable walls and barriers and breaks the chains of affliction. He restores the self-destructive. And again, these words are repeated in verse 21. And he brings peace during the storms of life. And he provides a safe haven or a harbour for the troubled and the anxious. That's worth praising God for. And again, the words are repeated in verse 31. And we should praise God because he judges the wicked and blesses the righteous, and he exalts the poor and the oppressed. We have much to praise God for, and be thankful towards God for, and to worship God for, and we're just going to do that now.
welcome to our service. Today I've been asked to do the prayer. Just quickly, you might want to wonder what's behind me. Behind me is the Pantheon. The Pantheon is a Roman temple that was built around about the time of Christ, around the time of Augustus, sometime between 27 BC and 14 AD. And in the seventh century it was taken over as a Catholic church and is known as the Basilica of Mary and the Martyrs. So this building has been around when Jesus Christ our Lord was walking this earth. So that's a sobering thought. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you are eternal. You're the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And you've been here forever and you will be here forever, Lord. Today is just a blip on the radar. That is just a breath long, according to you, Lord. You were around when the foundations of this building behind me were laid, Lord, and you'll be around when they're gone. We thank you for your awesomeness, Lord. We thank you for your majesty. We thank you for your sacrifice, and we thank you for your gift. Lord Father, we're in the trying times. We're in the desperate times. We're in difficult times, Lord. Help us to always turn to you. And you as our foundation, as our rock, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the NHS. We thank you for waking us up today. And we thank you for our warm homes that we live in. And we thank you for all your blessings. Lord, we do pray for those that are finding it difficult in this time with this extra lockdown, this extra tier four of lockdown, Father. We pray that you will be their anchor and you will be their rock. We thank you for the NHS. We thank you that it is at the moment coping. We ask that you will continue to give out resources to cope. We ask that uh, the possible vaccines that are coming online will be safe and they will achieve what they're have been set out to be achieved, Lord. We pray for your protection over your saints, Father, and those that do find illness, Lord, find rest in you, Father. Praise your holy name, Lord, and we thank you for your amazing provision and the way that we can gather together and virtually and worship you. Praise your name, Father. Thank you for today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Enjoy the rest of the service. The Friend Who Forgives A true story about how Peter failed and Jesus forgave. A long, long time ago, there was a man named Peter who was best friends with Jesus. Peter was a fisherman. He was strong and brave, but he often said the wrong thing. Do you ever talk before you think? That's what Peter did. Again and again and again. Peter loved fish. In fact, one day he and Jesus had fish for breakfast. Fish for breakfast? That's weird. But we will save that part of the story till the end. On the day when Jesus first called Peter to follow him, can you guess what Peter was doing? That's right, Peter was fishing. Follow me and I will make you a fisher of men, Jesus told him. Can you imagine that? Peter fishing for men? Jesus explained that just as Peter liked to search for fish, Jesus had come to search for people who needed forgiveness. Peter loved being friends with Jesus. He saw Jesus do lots of amazing things. One time, Peter's mother-in-law was sick. Jesus healed her. Another time, Peter was about to drown in a storm. Jesus saved him. Slowly, Peter realized that Jesus was more than a friend. He was God. He would never let Peter down. Jesus explained to his friends that he had to die on the cross, but that he would come back to life to 
to offer forgiveness. All of you will run away. You're going to say, you're not my friends, Jesus said. Peter spoke right away. He did that a lot. I will never do that, Peter said. But Jesus told him, before the rooster crows in the morning, you will say three times that you're not my friend. I would never do that. Jesus is my best friend, Peter thought. When soldiers came to take Jesus to the cross, Peter pulled out his sword to stop them. Put your sword away, Peter, Jesus said. My father says this must happen. Jesus let the soldiers take him to a courtyard to stand trial. Peter followed from far away. Aren't you one of Jesus' friends? A young girl asked as she opened a gate for Peter to enter the courtyard. What do you think Peter said? No, I don't know Jesus. It was a cold night, so Peter walked over to a fire where some people were warming themselves. Aren't you one of Jesus' friends? Someone asked Peter. What do you think Peter said? No, I don't know Jesus. Then someone else stepped forward and looked closely at Peter. Yes, you are one of Jesus' friends, aren't you? He said. What do you think Peter said? No, I don't know Jesus. Right then, at that very moment, a rooster crowed. Jesus turned around and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said, Before the rooster crows, you will say three times that you're not my friend. Peter was so sad. He knew he had failed Jesus again and again and again. He didn't just need to find other people who needed forgiving. He needed forgiving too. Peter felt terrible. He ran out of the courtyard and he cried and cried and cried. Peter had let his best friend down. And now it was too late because the soldiers had taken Jesus away to be killed. But Peter didn't stay sad because Jesus didn't stay dead. Three days later was the first Easter Sunday when Jesus came back to life to offer people forgiveness. One day, Jesus was looking for Peter. Where do you think Jesus found him? That's right, Peter and his friends were fishing. Jesus called to them from the beach. Peter jumped out of the boat into the water and rushed to the beach to see Jesus. And this is where Jesus and Peter had fish for breakfast. Fish for breakfast? That's weird. Peter was so happy to see Jesus alive. But would Jesus forgive him? Peter wasn't sure. Maybe Jesus wouldn't want to talk to him. Maybe Jesus wouldn't want to be friends with him. But yes, Jesus did want to talk to Peter. And yes, Jesus did want to forgive Peter. And since Peter had said he didn't know Jesus three times, Jesus gave Peter the chance to say three times, I love you, Jesus. That's how Peter became a forgiven fisher of men. Peter spent the rest of his life telling people about his best friend, Jesus. He told them that if they put their trust in Jesus, he would forgive them again and again and again. That's because Jesus was Peter's best friend. He forgave him again and again and again. And if you trust in Jesus, he will forgive you too, again and again and again. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm Vanessa. And uh, we just wanted to come on now just to uh, tell you something about what we've been doing over the past year. 
Um, uh, if you don't know already, I occasionally do some crazy things to try and fundraise for charity. I'm into outdoor sports, so I combine the two. And 2020 was coming up and I thought, oh, let's do 20 of something. So 20 marathons was decided. Um, this time last year, I was doing loads of logistics, sorting out, booking hotels, flights, getting to all these different marathons all, all over the place um, and actually entering the races. Um, then um, 2020 came along, I did five real marathons, uh, traveled about for them. Uh, Mid-March came along, I was taught two new words, um, COVID and furlough, and uh, my all plans went to pot, uh, the marathons were canceled. Uh, I thought, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna run them just by myself and just call it Matt's Marathon? People had sponsored me, so I had to do it, I couldn't give up. Um, marathon organizers helped out there by calling them virtual races. So you ran it in your locality, and uh, they sent you the medal and you could call it the virtual London Marathon, for example. Um, so that made it a little bit better and indeed people have sponsored me along the way. So the year has been uh, better than I first thought it would be back in March. Um, but it also made it a really good community event because people from the town came and ran with me for the odd race and uh, uh, also people came out cheering and we could get the family involved too. And Vanessa and the girls got involved in the races then. Yeah, the girls were able to make banners and run out and support Matt as he ran past. Like, Come on, daddy. And uh, we've even been known to nip back between laps and bake cupcakes for people at the end. Uh, I was also able to put it on Facebook. So one of the positive things about Facebook, we were able to get uh, more publicity for Matt so that people knew when he was gonna be passing their house if they lived on the route and they could come out and cheer him on, which has been really good. And um, so the marathons uh, clicks by, 17th marathon came along, Dublin virtual marathon it was. Yeah, well, I was feeling guilty about these other runners that were supporting Matt and uh, thinking, well, actually I run too, so maybe I should give him a bit more than just moral support. Um, so suggested maybe 10K or at a push a half marathon with him. Before I knew it, Matt had uh, signed me up for the Dublin Half Marathon virtual uh, and uh, then saw on Facebook that our pastor Woodsy, Richard Woods, had signed up also to do the Half Marathon virtually on that day uh, to raise money for Haiti. So we thought, brilliant, we can both support him in this one. So Woodsy ran the first half with him and I ran the second half with him. And uh, bonus for me is that I got some undivided attention with my pastor. Uh, I got uh, a good time with him whilst I was running and able to chat along to him. And also, we, Vanessa and I got some time together too, without being interrupted by anything. Certainly not by my talking. <laughs> and another benefit of the virtual marathons, because we were doing it around in the community, you could do them whenever you wanted. And indeed, like some of the events, you had to do them on the same day as the original day, but you could do it any time of day. So if it was a Sunday marathon, you could choose to avoid, right, for example, for us, for the Seagate family, avoid 11 till half 12. And people that I could witness to then, they understood that. So all the running club, they would say, oh, Matt won't want to do it between 11 and half 12. He'll want to be watching his church service then and be involved in that. And it got good conversation going about witness and uh, some uh, really good aspects to it there. And indeed, one person even joked, oh, I'll carry an iPad on my back and you can take part in the service whilst we're running along. Um, so there was added benefits. I probably wouldn't have got that if I'd have been attending the real events. Anyway, that was about uh, all the crazy stuff we've been doing it. We did it to fundraise, as I mentioned before, and it was for Alzheimer's Scotland. Yeah, uh, as many of you know, my mum Peggy is living with Alzheimer's and my dad Jim is her sole carer at the moment. Um, many of you will have met them through the church before lockdown. Uh, lockdown's been really hard for everyone for a variety of reasons, but particularly for the elderly, the vulnerable, those living alone, uh, but especially for people with dementia, they just don't understand all these restrictions and things. So it's become even more poignant to start raising money for Alzheimer's Scotland this year. So two marathons to go. Um, if you could uh, seek out my uh, online giving page, that'd be great. If you could sponsor me, uh, that'll help out. But thank you for listening. Thank you. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name.
Acts chapter 18, 18 to 28. Priscilla, Aquila and Apollos. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Centurai because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church, and they went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and travelled from place to place, throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervour and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only about the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Well, good morning and uh, welcome again uh, to our Seagate uh, service. And uh, uh, can I just, uh, before we dig into God's word, can I just uh, remind everybody, uh, I say remind everybody, you already know we are in uh, tier four, uh, the lockdown uh, restrictions. And that's just a reminder just to be looking after one another again, right? It's, it's really important that we're ringing, that we're calling, that we're texting. Um, and uh, that we're just trying to stay connected, particularly for those people who you know are perhaps isolated, living on their own, really important for that. And, and we have, a, a, as we've had throughout this whole crisis, we've had our practical support group. Uh, if you need help, if you need assistance, even if you just need somebody to talk to, um, then our practical support group uh, team is there to help you. Uh, the number for that is 07880355136. And uh, you can uh, get those details again in the announcements at the end of uh, the service. But just be looking out for one another. Let's bow our heads. Let's uh, pray together. Uh, dear Father God, um, we want to thank you for your word, Father. And as we dig into it uh, again this morning, into these uh, wonderful words in Acts, Father, would you just bless us? Uh, would you be the lifter of our heads? Would you be our comforter? And Father, would you speak truth to us, we pray, for your glory. Amen. Sometimes uh, when we are reading the Bible, we, uh, we long for there to be more detail, uh, to get some of the, some of the, the, the kind of interesting narrative details. Uh, and sometimes we just don't really get that. And in the verses that we've read this morning, that's really what happens. Luke has condensed uh, what was probably several months of Paul's uh, travels uh, into just a, a few verses. It's really just 10 verses. And indeed, not all of them are even about Paul's travels. Uh, there, there are no details, no nice details about him coming back to his home church in, in Antioch and, and kind of reporting all that's been done. There's nothing uh, about his trip to Jerusalem. 
But what we do have in these verses is really, I think, what we need. We might like that, but what's here, as is often the case in the Bible, is what we really need. And what I think here is happening is that there is just a little pause, right? Just a, a short pause in the story of Paul's mission, right? Paul is, uh, had this hectic uh, travel and hectic missionary schedule, and that's going to continue in Acts chapter 19. But what we've got here is just a little pause. And that little pause allows us, I think, uh, to do two things. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to just look at two things. Firstly, what God has done, looking back at what God has done and the mission that uh, Paul has been on. And then it gives us a little glimpse into Paul's mission team, into his gospel team. Uh, and that a reminder that he's not on his own, that he works in a team. So that's where we're going this morning. That's what we're going to do as we try to unpack these verses together. Now, we know from Luke that, that Paul basically went on three missionary journeys. And, and this pause comes uh, at the end of the second one and the kind of beginning of his third missionary journey. And what a journey, what a journey it has been for Paul. He had, to, you might remember, he had that uh, amazing call and vision in, in chapter 16. He was in Asia and he was looking at, 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 at working with the churches in Asia and he gets this vision of a man calling him to Europe, calling him to Macedonia, part of, part of Europe. And so he goes across uh, to that city of Philippi, right? And, uh, and he brings the good news of Jesus to Europe for the first time. And, and, and again and again, as, as Paul is on his travels, uh, again and again, he preaches and he tells people about Jesus. And, and as people hear it, and as they listen to the good news, they listen and they hear who Jesus is, they, they come to know him. Their, their hearts are opened. Their, they, they are no longer blind. They go from, uh, from death to life and they put their hope and their trust and their life in Jesus. They, they cry out, what must I do to be saved? And Paul's answer, as it always is, is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And from Philippi to Thessalonica to Athens to, to Corinth, um, what we see is people just giving their lives uh, to Jesus, believing in him, being transformed, and, and lives are changed. Uh, people from all classes and from uh, uh, men and women and from all cultural backgrounds, they're brought into this relationship with Jesus Christ. But my goodness me, it wasn't easy. It was really, really hard. There were amazing moments, but there were really big challenges right? In Philippi, uh, these guys were dragged into the courts. They were beaten. They were uh, thrown into, into jail. Um, in, in Thessalonica, they have to run. They have to, they're chased out of town. They have to run, uh, running in fear for their lives. Uh, in the Athens, and they're, they're mocked and, and laughed at and ridiculed by the people who are there. And then they're dragged back into court in, in Corinth, Paul's dragged back into court in Corinth, but of course, amazingly, amazingly, incredibly, he's delivered. He doesn't even have to say a word, right? And that's a great thing. It's a great thing because the, the charges are dismissed against uh, Paul and against the church in Corinth, and they can keep on proclaiming the gospel. But what you have as, you, as we pause and we look back is this picture of the reality of mission, the mission that we are on, right, at both then and now. There'll be good times. There will be good times, uh, but there are painful and hard times. But in every single season, God is at work. Sometimes, uh, in the hardest of times, 
in the darkest of moments when they were in that dark dungeon in Philippi, that in that moment, God, God was still working. God still had a plan. And of course, it was transformed as the, as the jailer himself came to know uh, Jesus. The most unlikely person came to know Jesus. And so it's been this incredible time. And as it comes to the end of that time, what we have recorded for us by Luke is this really interesting story, a uh, little, little detail of Paul shaving his head because he had come to the end of a vow, the kind of Jewish custom of, of making a vow and growing his hair. And now we're not told we're not told explicitly what vow Paul had made, but there are some clues as to what it might have been about from the Old Testament. Uh, it was a, almost certainly a Nazarite vow from Numbers chapter 6. And it says this, as long as they are bound by their Nazarite vow, they are not allowed to eat or drink anything that comes from a grapevine, not even the grape seeds or skins. They must never cut their hair throughout the time of their vow, right? For they are holy and set apart to the Lord until the time of their vow has been fulfilled. They must let their hair grow long. So I think that's what Paul is doing here. And this type of vow was made either generally as thankfulness for a period of God's blessing that you've experienced, or in anticipation of God's protection for something that lies ahead. Now, we're not exactly sure which one of those it was, but I want to suggest to you this morning that perhaps Paul had decided to enter into this vow in response to God's protection of him in Corinth. It was, a, it was an expression of Paul's thankfulness. God uh, had promised him in a dream in Corinth. Paul, who was struggling, and the, the things were just weighing in on him and getting hard and difficult, and, and God had come to him and said, listen, don't be afraid. Keep on going. Keep keep speaking about me, keep talking about me, and, and listen, I will protect you. In Corinth, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to look after you. And of course, that is exactly what happened in the court case. It came to be Paul was protected, and he'd stayed there, and he'd preached for 18, 18 months. The growing of, of the hair was perhaps for Paul this very public, very a personal reminder to be thankful for all that God had done for him in Corinth, for all that God had done for them on mission. Every day he would see his hair getting longer and growing, and it would remind him to be thankful. Now, you know what? We are in a really difficult challenging time for us as a church. Here I am in November. I never imagined that in November, when this began in March, that I would be preaching to an empty room. We long still for the day when we will be back together. And yet here we are in November, and we're into tier four the full lockdown. And the word that I, I keep hearing from people is that I'm just, we're, we're, we're tired, we're scunnered. We're just scunnered. And do you know what? It's easy to be in that situation. And I have been. I have been just downhearted. And you just, a sense of, you know, everything's just happening and this is hard. And in that season, it can be really difficult to be thankful, to be thankful to God. It's an everyday effort. It, it doesn't come naturally, but, but God is at work. He is at work in the midst of this hard times. Let me say to you, in fact, that, that God may be, he may be more at work in this time, in this season, as hard as it is, than he was when things were easy and comfortable. 
And, and let me tell you that here in Troon, the, the mission, right, this mission, believe it or not, the mission that Paul was on, this mission in Troon, I, I pray, I hope, I, I believe that it's continuing, that God is still at work. Listen, there is more openness to the good news about Jesus. Even still, there's more people willing to, to engage in that conversation just to, to witness about Jesus, to share our faith. We, we, we see it in our job club. You might see it yourself, but in our job club, uh, we just see it as we're just able to share our faith and talk about uh, the deeper things of life. I, I hear stories nearly every week from people saying, I, I asked somebody if they would like prayer, if they would like me to pray with them, and, and, and I was able to pray with them. I was able to pray with them and to pray for them. And we've had uh, Khalid's baptism that we, we shared in virtually uh, here. We have, we have our small groups studying that the whole topic of, of thankfulness, and, and yeah, for sure, the small groups, they're not, they're not perfect. They're never going to be perfect. But we have this, this, this connection, meeting people that we ordinarily wouldn't have sat down and met with, talked with, heard from. And yes, it's been hard. Yeah, it's been really hard. People are isolated, and they're lonely, and they're tired. But you know, saying God is the lifter of our heads. He's the lifter of our heads. He's the one who gives us rest for our soul. And this is, listen, this is God's mission. It's God's mission, right? In God's world, uh, through God's people, by God's Holy Spirit, in the good and the, and the bad times. It goes forward. It keeps on going. That is that's the whole tagline of this series in Acts. And so we keep on going. We keep on going. We're, we're thankful, so, so thankful that we who are broken and fallen and uh, we're sinners and we're so often rubbish. And we get to be part of the greatest mission ever. We're invited to tell people about Jesus. That's the mission. Go and be witnesses to Jesus. Go on, go on and, and tell people about what he's done. Text them and tell them. Email them and tell them. Ring them and tell them about what Jesus has done for us, about the hope that he's given us, about the, the life that he has given us, about how he has saved us, about how he has loved us and chosen us and, and, and invested us with purpose and meaning. And a hope that goes beyond COVID, goes beyond death. We have so much to be thankful for what God has done. So much to be thankful for what God has done. Uh, if you want, you can, you can put up a visual reminder if you want. Put up a visual reminder. It doesn't have to be your hair. But that you grow long, but hey, none of us are going to the, to the hairdressers for the next three weeks anyway, so maybe it will be. You'll grow your hair. Maybe that'll work for you, but remember, even in this time, to be thankful. God is at work. But as we, as we come to the end of this second uh, mission trip, we are reminded once again that Paul is not on his own. He's not on his own. There's a, a team around him that he could rely upon. Now, you, you'll notice in, in verse uh, 20 that, that Paul was invited to stay in Ephesus. He's in Ephesus. He's chatting to the guys. They invite him to stay. They want him to stay. Um, and he politely declines, right? Now, lots of stuff written about that but uh, uh, and why he declines. I think it's because he's... he's uh, focused on God's mission and focused on what God wants him to do, uh, completely focused on that. But what is absolute, I think I'm absolutely certain about is that he was content to continue to Jerusalem and home to Antioch because he was not working in Ephesus alone. Other people were going to stay and carry on the work. 
right? And, and two of that team are, are people that we were introduced to back at the very start of the chapter, Priscilla and Aquila. They'd been expelled from Rome uh, in that kind of anti-Semitic purge by Claudius. Uh, and they had met Paul, and they would work with him in Corinth. They were both, uh, they were all tent makers. Uh, Paul had lived uh, with them. Uh, and, and this couple, this beautiful, godly couple that kind of serve in the background, it, it's, it, they're not, this is not the only time that this is, they are mentioned in the New Testament. They're mentioned several times, but in Romans uh, 16, verse 3, this is what Paul says. He says, give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. In fact, they once risked their lives for me. I, I am thankful to them, and so are all the Gentile churches. Right? And also, he says, give my greetings to the church that meets in their home. These guys are part of Paul's close gospel team. And Luke here just gives us this beautiful insight into part of the ministry that this couple had. In verse 24, we're, we're introduced uh, to Apollos uh, and uh, this guy, Apollos, who's this uh, great um, preacher uh, and speaker. He's got lots of enthusiasm and uh, he knows the scriptures well. He's a great speaker uh, and, and, and preacher. And I, and I don't think there's any doubt that Apollos is a, is a Christian. Um, there's no mention here of him being baptized or any of that. I think he is a Christian here. Uh, it says he only knew about the baptism of John. Now, we, we, we don't know exactly what that means. But what is clear is that he didn't have the whole picture. Didn't have the whole picture. His, his knowledge, what he was preaching, was deficient. But look at how Priscilla and Aquila deal with him, right? Look at how they deal with him. They listen to him speaking, and then we're going to see how they deal with him. And I want us to see not only how they deal with him, but how he reacts, how he reacts to that, right? Acts 18, verse 26, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explain the way of God even more accurately. Here's a guy, clearly gifted. The fire is there. He's fervent in spirit. There's a fire. And he, but he just needs some guidance, some teaching, some development. And what Aquila and Priscilla, they, they don't tear him down. They don't pour out the fire. They... they they don't criticize him for what he's getting wrong, right? They explain the way of God even more accurately. They fan the flames. Here is this couple, and they're gently and kindly taking aside this man, Apollos. Very much in the background. He's the upfront man. They're in the background, and they're investing in him for future work. And they're investing in him and for the blessing of the church, right? And, and, and let me give you another example of that. In, 18, in 1784, sorry, at the age of 25, uh, a, a young William Wilberforce uh, spent time with his close friend Isaac Milner uh, on a holiday. Uh, and as he spent time on that holiday, uh, Wilberforce uh, believed himself at that point to be a Christian. He thought he was a Christian. But as Isaac Milner got alongside him, as they spent time quietly, privately, and got alongside him, he explained, I, I, I guess you could say, explained to Wilberforce that, that the way of God even more accurately. And during that holiday, he he, Wilberforce recommitted his life in a new way to Christ. And of course, you know that he went on to, to, uh, to achieve uh, and to devote his life and uh, ultimately achieve the abolition of slavery just three days before he, he died. It's a great benefit for, great, great benefit for many people, for the church, 
But that public ministry is helped and guided by the private ministry of friends like Isaac Milner. And you see, this is what Paul means when he, when he speaks in Ephesians 4 uh, about everyone having a role to play in the church. We've all got a, a role to play to build up the church, to build up for the benefit of the church. And perhaps your role is not up front, but there are people, maybe even as a couple, there are people that you can identify. And you could explain the way of God gently and more accurately to them. You hear them speak and you think, oh, there's fire there, there's potential there. I could guide them. I could disciple them quietly in the background, build them up, invest in them with time and with knowledge. Too easy, too easy to hear someone speak someone preach, someone share in the, in, in, in the small group and to tear them down. Priscilla and Aquila build them up. Could that be you? Can that be you? Can you build up? Can you invest? But equally important as the investment is I want you to see how Apollos responded to it. Because you see, Apollos took it on board and he listened. And that's no small feat for the guy who's the big preacher and the, and the guy who's, who's, who's got it going on. Right? But Apollos listens to what Aquila and Priscilla have to say to him. Someone reminded me this week, um, gently reminded, actually a couple of people have mentioned it, um, to infest in, in fat Christians. Fat Christians, a good way to remember that. Fat, faithful, available, and teachable. Faithful, available, and teachable, willing to learn. See, Apollos was all three. He was passionately faithful. He was, he was ready to go to Achaia, over back into Corinth, and that whole region. So he was available to go and he was faithful and fervent, but most importantly of all, he was teachable. Are we teachable? Am I teachable? If someone comes to me and says, let me help you to understand that better, am I willing to listen? Do I assume I know more than they do? You know, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful to those who've invested in me. Sometimes their advice was painful. Sometimes their advice made me look um, at difficult things in my life that I didn't want to look at. But sometimes the biggest blessings are, are listening to the kind loving words of others. And Apollos did that perfectly. And it blessed him and it blessed the church. Look at what he says. When he arrived there in Achaia, he proved to be of great benefit to those who by God's grace had believed. He, he refuted the Jews with public argu par powerful arguments in public debate. Using the scriptures, he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah. Will we be people who build up, encourage, and teach others? Will we be people who are faithful, available, and teachable? Not for our own benefit, but so we can do what Apollos did and explain that Jesus is the Messiah. And as we close this morning, as we press pause, which we're going to do on our Acts series until 2021, we'll come back to it uh, after Christmas. Please let me plead with you this morning. If we are Christians, this is the mission. The mission is to be witnesses to Jesus. 
to tell about him. To tell people about how he's changed us and transformed us. To identify other people in the church and to build them up. To share with them how to, how to, how to know God more accurately and better. To be part of the team. And how we can then attest that Jesus is alive and real. And we can know him. And he gives us rest and peace and his promises are, are sure. But listen, if you listen to these services wherever you live and you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, then I, I implore you, I'm pleading with you, come and explore what it means to be a Christian. There is not unlimited time Right. This is not something for another day. The Bible tells us quite clearly this is the day of salvation. We are, we're, we're not promised any other day. And the Savior that I know and I love, he longs, he longs to be in relationship with you. He longs for you to come and to know him, for you to believe in him, for you to be saved, for your sins, for all the things that uh, all our brokenness, all, our, all the things that we, 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 we hate about ourselves. Just for the slate to be wiped clean no matter what you've done. No matter what you've done. To be rescued from the darkness of death and the reality of judgment. There is a judgment that is coming. Please, I implore you, come and and discover that Jesus is the Messiah. He is God's son. He is God's anointed king. And he will return. And he longs to know you. To be the lifter of your head. To be your savior. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we thank you for all that you're doing. Father, make us more thankful, we pray. Press it in on us that we would be more thankful for all that you're doing. And dear Father God, we, we pray that you would make us faithful, available, teachable. Father, would you make us people who, who get alongside and build others up? for the purposes of blessing your church. Father, we pray for that, and we pray that in, this, uh, in these hard weeks that lie ahead, Father, of lockdown, Father, keep us connected. Keep us united, we pray, by your Holy Spirit, for your glory. Amen. <laughs>
the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow sin had left a crimson stain he Well, uh, we've come uh, to a communion uh, part of our service uh, this morning. And uh, um, can, I, can I say to you that if you know and love the Lord as your uh, personal Savior, then we invite you in your own home to come and to, to take bread and to take wine with us. There's nothing uh, magical. Uh, we don't believe there's anything magical about the bread or the wine. Uh, what they are, are, are symbols of remembrance. Uh, they're ways that we can remember what Jesus did for us as Christians, of how he gave his life uh, to pay our sins and to make us children of God. That is what uh, happened at the cross of Calvary. And this is our call to remembrance, our call uh, to, to be thankful. Uh, to be thankful for all that God has done for us. Sins forgiven, the price paid, justice satisfied, and love confirmed. Mark chapter 16 says this, At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. Wait, he said. Let's see whether Elijah comes to take him down. Then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. The curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, For I pass on to you, we read these words every week, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself on the night that he was betrayed. 
the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Dear Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son. We thank you for the hope and the joy and the love that his sacrifice has brought to us. The hope of eternal life, sins forgiven, children of God. Father, fill our hearts this day with joy, we pray. For your glory. Amen. As we come to the end of our service this morning, we're going to worship together.
Thanks so much for uh, joining us here at uh, Seagate Church. Uh, again, a reminder, if you're watching this, you need any help or assistance at all um, during this new uh, Tier 4 situation, then please uh, get in contact with us. Uh, we'd love to, to help you. We'd love to get to know you. And we'd love to tell you uh, about why uh, we believe Jesus is just the greatest, greatest thing and will transform your life. Uh, but... May God go with you this week. May the, the Lord bless you and keep you. And may he make his face to shine upon you. God bless you. Amen.